as an Iraqi, there are many similarities that I see with the position of Iraq and Yemen's um, war today. From the war to the financial constraints, which is promoted by the international financial institutions and the support of the neoliberal agenda, which I'll go on to later speak about. Yemen's current war has killed more than 100,000 people since 2015. There are almost a million reported cases of cholera, a thousand confirmed cases of COVID-19, 3.65 million people displaced, 17 million people are suffering from famine, and 10 million people are on the brink of starvation. People are suffering from hunger, from disease, and all of it is inflated far worse um, into a far worse disaster because of what the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the US, and the UK have brought onto Yemen. Almost five years since Saudi's bombing campaigns, the land, the air, and the sea blockade, which has been responsible for, most people in the UK aren't particularly aware of it. You can stop most people on the road and they wouldn't know what Yemen's facing today. And the fact that it is one of the world's most worst humanitarian crisis ever, let alone that the fact that the UK is enabling, facilitating, authorizing, aiding and abetting the slaughter. So I know like uh, for the past few weeks, Yemen has been all over social media in particular, but people think it's just as a result of famine due to lack of resources rather than war. And a lot of this is also due to the media's positioning, which has, um, to no surprise, either completely ignored the destruction of Yemen, or if they did report it, they presented it as a violence that only incurs as a result of a proxy war between Iran and the Gulf monarchies, or Sunni and Shia sectarian violence, when in fact it's a US and UK backed massacre, which for those who did, were able to read, um, I wanted to kind of start, it, start off talking about the Jeremy Hunt article, the preposterous one that was written. And he says, and I quote, <laughs> we could of course decide to condemn them instead. We could halt our military exports and sever the ties that British governments of all parties have carefully preserved for decades. And as critics are urging, but in doing so, we would also surrender our influence and make ourselves irrelevant to the course of events in Yemen. Our policy was simply, um, was, was simply to leave the parties to fight it out while denouncing them impotently from the sidelines. And this is like, for me personally, one of the most audacious things in the article. But what Jeremy Hunt does, maybe inconspicuously, is kind of Note the fact that and acknowledge that Britain's role in Yemen is to keep its influence and to remain relevant, as he states. And in the same article, he begins to speak about how the UK has provided £200 million in aid to Yemen last year. And I really want everyone to listen to this particular um, like number, because whilst Britain tries to pretend it has this almost benevolent role in Yemen, it's quite laughable. Because while it has provided 200 million um, pounds in aid to Yemen, this is just a drop in the ocean to its arms sales to Saudi Arabia, right? Since 2015, the UK has sold 6.4 billion pounds in arms to Saudi Arabia. The contradiction between the air to alleviate and the consequences of bombings and the financing of the bombings itself, and then the training of the bombing itself is something that the UK government again fails to address and ergo, we go through this horrifying cycle of abuses despite the UK government's stance, and it does not make us any safer. The arms trade, which um, Andrew always very well does to highlight, is one of the most insidious trades which capitalism has propelled. Not only because of its billions of um, pounds that it extorts, but in the profound impact it has had in enabling conflicts and ensuring that it undermines our development or economic states um, in, the in the way that the West deems to stop any threatening governments or groups it um, proposes are against us. And all of this in, in the face to eventually corrupt our governments via bribing politicians or lobbying groups, etc. And to take a quick Side note, what makes it all the more sinister is that the UK fails to address the ways in which the arms trade undermines economic and development progress is because these nations 
are also aware of the deadly impact that neoliberalism has had in Yemen in the past two decades, which for anyone who did get to do the reading of Yemen in crisis, it's chapter nine, right? Now for those who weren't able to, I'll try and very briefly explain what neoliberalism is. Now, neoliberalism is the idea that governments and the private um, governments should be small and the private sector and businesses should be big. So the government should allow businesses and their private sector to not pay their correct contributions in tax, not be regulated by law on how it fulfills its businesses, and services such as healthcare or education should be left to the private sector. Now, the problem with this is that it doesn't work. When neoliberals tend to fulfill their twisted vision by cutting government services like pensions, women's shelters, um, people's basic rights, and they deregulate businesses by loosening environmental and worker protections and privatizing government assets such as, or people's assets such as water, gas, transport, health, etc. It makes the government money in the short run, but has a disastrous effect in the long run. And the deadly effects of what I like to call neoliberalism, uber capitalism, can be seen all over Yemen. So neoliberal economic policies promoted by the IMF combined with former regime's complacency in its government, which existed due to what they said, a lack of alternative policies in Yemen, despite Yemen previously being socialist, allowed the increase of poverty and caused long-term social and economic damage in Yemen. And the numbers are mortifying. So right now, about 70% of the youth are either unemployed or not employed and not in education. Um, which many observers actually say this is an underestimation of the youth unemployment at the time. Only 8% of labor for the force had any kind of university degree to begin with, and 17% are illiterate, including a substantial number of younger workers or child workers, etc. And about 33% are said to be barely literate or had only completed a primary school education and only a 20% got to fulfill a secondary or equivalent certificate. Now, these statistics are striking to any society that dreams of rebuilding after war. Now, when you intertwine neoliberalism as an economic policy with war, you see the result it hands out. And it's no secret that um, it creates many polit politicians a chance to make exuberant, exuberant amounts of wealth because of the ties that these politicians have to these companies. For example, when we go back to the 2003 occupation of Iraq, Dick Cheney's wealth went through the roof because of his shares in Halliburton. He made Halliburton billions of dollars on the bodies of dead Iraqis. So for the UK government, this, this blueprint for chaos, war, and thousands of Yemenis dead is also a blueprint for profit, billions and billions worth of profit which again makes the Jeremy Hunt article completely laughable because for him to say that the war would have happened regardless of Britain's role in, when the former Ministry of Defense and Mandarin and Defense for Attaché to Saudi Arabia and Yemen himself said the Saudi bosses absolutely depend on BAE systems and they couldn't do it without us. Now again, this is really important because this came from an employee of the Ministry of Defense. So to act as if the UK's role is very small or everything in Yemen would have continued to take place if the UK decided to stop arming Yemen. It's absurd. Even employees of the BAE systems have formally said that if we stop making the weapons, there wouldn't be anything pretty soon. So the UK can also pretend to feign ignorance regarding where Saudi airstrikes are going to. And I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago in the panel. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things this time around, just so we know that this umbilical relationship that the UK has with Saudi Arabia during this war cannot be whitewashed because it's also an umbilical relationship to Saudi Arabia's deadly crimes. So first, I think it's important to note that the United Nations itself wrote a report that said the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has targeted civilians in a widespread and systematic matter, manner. This is not short of just hitting schools, weddings, funerals, and even camps where displaced people decided to reside because they wanted to flee the bombs in the cities. But they have also targeted hospitals. 
And this is despite Saudi Arabia having the coordinates, um, coordinations of where the hospitals are, which is again a breach of international humanitarian law. So it's interesting because when Sienna started the meeting, she, she usually asks people, where are you from? And some of the cities and towns people gave are actually where these deadly weapons are being manufactured. So whether it's Raytheon manufacturers in Harlow, BMDA manufacturers in Lowstock, Rolls-Royce manufacturers in Bristol, yes, they don't only just make cars, um, Kemmering manufacturers in Draycott, Saywell in Wothing, Selex in Luton, all over the UK, we create these deadly weapons that are implicit in this war. But most importantly, I want to draw attention to BAE systems. And perhaps the company that has made the most amount of wealth due to giant aircraft deals. Yemen BAE manufactured um, Typhoon and Tornado aircraft, which Saudi Arabia has largely used in its war. And their contract was finalized around 2014 where 72 Euro fighters Typhoon aircraft, aircraft were agreed upon for 4.5 billion. And then the UK directly in licensed a further 120 BAE produced tornado jets. And it was Tony Blair himself, which was implicit in stopping any investigations to exploring or questioning the legality of these weapons being sold, etc. And then in 2013 to 2016, more billions of dollars were agreed upon to contract a further 22 Hawk aircrafts at the time. Now, once these weapons are manufactured in Britain and then sold to Britain uh, and then sold to Saudi Arabia, pardon me, it's important to understand that Britain's involvement doesn't stop there. The Saudi military does not have a single clue on how to use the weaponry and lacks the particular expertise. So then further contracts are drawn for more billions of pounds for the UK to help train Saudi on how to use these weapons. And then they are also the ones that are um, responsible for giving the coordinations and providing logistics and um, private help and ensuring that um, Saudi Arabia knows where to target, etc. Thus, the UK arms sales to Saudi Arabia has enabled the regime's abuse of human rights and repression of calls for democracy in its own nation, but it has also enabled its military aggression across the region. And it's a bit ironic because its mission, if anything, has failed astronomically because the planes that were, that are there to defeat the Houthi rebels as intended, didn't do that. Instead, it's just bolstered the support for these Houthis. Now, I, I think it's also important to mention America's role in all of this because it also plays an awful role. Like Britain, it provides logistics for the attacks, but the US is also a bit more insidious in the fact that it's US planes which fly over Yemen, waiting to refuel Saudi fighter jets in the air so it can attack Yemenis. Now, we have to really understand how sick and twisted that is, firstly. And what's really ironic is people often try to juxtapose Obama's administration to Trump's one to make the former look a bit more morally righteous. So for those who don't know, in the remaining days of Obama's presidency, he had halted some arms sales to Saudi Arabia, but he also agreed to fuel Saudi Arabia's bombs in the sky while continuing to do so and continue to sell other airdrop munitions. But this was done under the guise that he believed that civilians were being targeted and it was no more just. But he only did this in the last few weeks of his presidency. So it's almost a means to appease and whitewash his attempts or former crimes as president, etc. And a lot of liberal media tries to then play Trump as this more evil role because as soon as he was instated into presidency, he continued to sell all the terrible bombs and um, removed any ban that was previously in place. But both presidencies were complicit regardless of whether they were Democrats or regardless of whether they were Republican. And Trump has such a friendly relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that he had chosen Saudi Arabia as his first international destination as president. And to seal the deal with a kiss, I suppose, they ended it with a signature of over $300 billion over the next 10 year period for the US to help Saudi Arabia to boost its defensive capabilities. So to expect, I guess, the US to take a more of a humanitarian stand regarding the Yemeni people 
would be an act of naivety. The US continues to provide um, targeting advice in its operation rooms, like the UK, provides weapons, intelligence, and training to its members, like the UK. The US Air Force has played an active part, um, participation in airstrikes, including airstrikes which have killed civilians and destroyed civilian facilities itself, etc. So no brush stroke over Obama's presidency and no brush stroke over Trump's presidency can be seen as anything less than lethal. In the same manner that we cannot see anything that Boris Johnson has done as anything less than lethal or Tony Blair's labor when it decided to completely stop the investigation taking place. So the internationalization of this war in particular has made it almost impossible for peace to ever be a possibility. And to see a rapid end to this war, almost close to impossible. So we must ensure that what we make imperative is that the US, the UK and other Western states stop arming the genocidal state of Saudi Arabia. Western priorities is nothing short of expansion of already an extravagant sales, but they make sure it's even more, um, to create even more fantastic figures of billions of dollars and pounds in weapons as seen by Trump and Jeremy Hunt. And these are unnecessary expense of technology in appropriately responding to any real threat to these reasons, but which offers opportunities for further enrichments of only a few sides um, to these wars, rather than helping anyone on the ground. So I think it's important to kind of wrap up and speak of a few points that are made in the book in chapter two, where she details three complex points in Yemen's history which has affected Yemen's future. The first one being the fact that Yemen voted against um, the UN resolution to attack Iraq after the Kuwait invasion. Um, this act of solidarity resulted in the US cutting $7 billion of aid to Yemen and being angry at Yemen for taking Iraq's side, etc. And then the Gulf states itself, it kind of propelled what was already a rocky relationship because they ended up expanding 800,000 Yemeni workers from Gulf states. Secondly would be the 9-11 attacks. After the 9-11 attacks, President Saleh sent a message of full support to President Bush and then was given $70 billion worth of um, aid. So it left him in a strong position despite Saudi, the Saudi-led coalition disliking him. And then thirdly would be President Saleh's um, resignation in 2011 and the Yemeni uprisings which begun then, which then threatened Saudi Arabia's wealth because they were worried of a government being put into place that was not friendly to them. So Saudi Arabia's role in Yemen goes back to as early to 1934, where they tried to stop Arab socialism from spreading because they believed it again threatened their religious monarchy. And believing the kingdom at the time, believing in its massive military capacity, thanks um, to decades of UK and US training, thought that they could beat the one of the poorest nations in the world, let, let alone the region. So these three moments in time, etc. again, all depends on how Yemen pleases Western states. So now that they see Yemen not as a, there's no need for it to be a friendly ally for them in the region, they see the opportunity to pummel billions of dollars in arms trade out of it. So I'll quickly conclude so we can actually start discussing the book now. It is British and in international humanitarian law itself which says it is illegal to license arms exports, especially if they are deliberately used against civilians. And there is an overwhelming evidence from the United Nations to Amnesty International, to Yemeni organizations in the ground, that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been robustly in violation of humanitarian law and has deliberately attacked civilians. So of course, anything that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia does the UK is also implicit and responsible for, again, this umbilical relationship. 